This next video is titled Working with Congress, and I bet it's going to go great. I hope it's an office parody. You know, let's get, get some Dunder Mifflin energy up in this fascist indoctrination. Hi, my name's Hugh Fike. I'm the current director of government relations at the- Oh God, it, it's, it's, it's going at 1.25 speed and he talks like a normal person. Oh God, he sounds cr he, <laughs> he sounds cracked out. Uh, just, just play a couple more seconds. Conservative Partnership Institute, and I worked in the Office of Management and Budget in the Executive <laughs> Office of the President doing legislative affairs. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, dude. That's unfair to you. I haven't heard what you have to say yet to call you a monster. On the House side, and I'm joined by my friend and former colleague, James Braid. Hi, I'm James. I've, I've worked in various uh, senior roles on Capitol Hill. Uh, Man, the vibes in that room seem absolutely bad. Absolutely terrible. Hoy polloi, do you know these guys? Do you know these chuckle nuts? He's on these... Yeah, honestly, anyone who's willing to associate their name and face with this is uh, almost definitionally a monster. Yeah, I... Uh, I'm getting bad, bad vibes from these two. I worked with Hugh in the administration in legislative affairs at the Office of Management and Budget, specifically handling appropriations. Currently, I, I serve as the legislative director for Senator J.D. Vance. Oh, and we're here to talk about uh, congressional relations with the administration. Very bad Essentially, vibes. it's going to be a legislative affairs 101. All right. In the eyes of many in the world, Lay it on us. this every four year ceremony we accept as normal is nothing less than a miracle. In America, we understand that a nation is only living as long as it is striving. Only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. Whether we go forward together with courage or turn back to policies that weakened our economy, diminished our leadership in the world, America's future will be in your hands. Let's kind of get into it. I'll just sort of uh, surface kind of the top top line understanding of how I think about the Hill from a theoretical perspective. The Hill is a mechanism for information processing. So we have Ain't all these no preferences, these asterisk, all these different asterisk, issues, asterisk, all these asterisk, different um, asterisk, 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 policies that are happening in the United States. In the and uh, how do we make them into a coherent legal document? I that really actually like can, that it can maybe do some it censored uh, good everything for the but motherfuckers. Well. We have this huge machinery uh, called Capitol Hill, which is, you know, includes the procedure, right? You might think of that as the software by which the computer runs. You might think of uh, members of Congress as the individual decision-making nodes. What we do in the executive branch in legislative affairs is serve as the surface area between the decision-makers in the executive branch and the decision-makers in Congress in hopes of pushing information and persuasive policies out there so that we can influence the operation of that machine. Uh -huh. And that's what we're gonna talk about today, some of the basic strategies that we need to pursue in order to Be ensure evil. that yeah. the president's agenda uh, is considered as favorably as humanly possible on Capitol Hill. Yeah, I think about it, if you get into a legislative affairs job that you basically have three marching orders. One, you gotta have staff relationships. Two, you gotta have good principal relationships. And three, it's you ultimately need to know what the issues that the members care about. A. F. F. Oh, wait, we got to read this. The role of the executive branch legislative affairs is to influence the operation of the machine that is Capitol Hill and to ensure the president's agenda is in considered as favorably as possible. Three marching orders. They, they already said this. Why, why, not, why not edit this screen over them saying these words? Why... Why? What? Editing, what are you doing? It's 
so awkward and long. So speaking specifically to staff relationships, if you're on the beachhead team, uh, you know, I didn't serve on the beachhead team, but everybody that did say you're, if you're changing In administrations, America, if you're basically switching that the from the nation a is only bottoming, if it is occasionally topping. <laughs> yeah, you know. In America, we understand people are switches. Uh, you know, from a conservative to a liberal administration, Very true. you're not going to be left with the tools or you're not going to have the lists of things that you're going to need, absolutely need. So, And, on, you know, like, I, I, I'm not saying that's true of everyone, but I am saying, like, you know, a lot of Americans go out there and they they say that they're switches. And you know what? I think that the real message that you should take away from Project 2025 is that when people say they're switches, just just believe them, okay? Just believe them. Yeah. One of your first priorities uh, is to obviously work with, uh, you know, the administration to figure out what the priorities of the uh, agency or the part of the administration you're in. I'm joking. Um, but then start yeah, developing me, lists me of too. members um, that include staff members for the equities or the things that are uh, are necessarily going to be important to your day to day job. And so what you want to do is immediately start creating lists of the committees on Capitol Hill, both on the House and the Senate, that, uh, that are going to be important for um, direct legislative jurisdiction over, uh, over your agency's areas. Um, then you need to start doing individual meetings with them, putting a face to a name. That's really important. Um, and then you need to have uh, make sure you have the right contact information. These are in sometimes very quick uh, moving um, decisions and they are quick moving and that you need to be able to directly communicate with those people, not just via email, but be able to pick up the phone and call people because things move very quickly. And in the administration, I found that, you know, th this is in direct opposition to that first video where they, the, 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 the two very nice ladies said that uh, government moves very slowly. And if somebody comes to you with an emergency, ignore them because they're a little bitch. I, I think those were her exact words. So, uh, who am I to believe? Am I, should I believe you guys? Or do I believe them? Well, as a conservative viewing this, I, I believe these men because they clearly know what they're talking about. Because due to conservative ideology, I know they both have penises. You don't uh, always have the uh, most amount of time to be able to prep or give. Uh, and as we all know, penises are inherently trustworthy. <laughs> uh, members or their staff heads up, um, but like you need to do that right vaginas. after the thing is announced. Um, so that's staff relationships. Talk to me a little bit about what it means to have um, good principal member uh, relationships in that you, you are directly engaging with the uh, members that are either on the committee or important Do to the principal. Are you One sure about that? One of the things I that? would say that no. is a little bit uh, of, a, of, a, of a surprise, I think, to people who encounter Congress for the first time is that each individual Hill office is a small business unto itself. They have different cultures, they have different relationships between staff, and they have different decision-making structures. And those structures are entirely idiosyncratic. You can probably take a guess that the chief of staff is going to be an important decision maker. But often, you know, a legislative assistant might be the key decision making person in the area that you're looking to work on, right? And so I think to your point about we come in and we don't have the infrastructure built and we're not going to get the infrastructure and we have to build the infrastructure on the fly, I think the absolute core aspect of that, that infrastructure is segmentation. You've got to come in and understand relate. Well, keep in mind, this was probably filmed before everyone hated J.D. Vance to the extent that they do right now in the Republican Party. You like, you, you know, like right now, no one could have foreseen the J.D. Vance in drag photos. Nobody could have foreseen J.D. Vance uh, getting clowned on for having amorous relations with uh, love seats. You know, no one could have predicted it, okay? Like, life's a funny thing. Sometimes it comes at you fast. Especially if you're J.D. Vance's couch. Relationships that are important and vital to form immediately. And th those, those categories of people are going to be the authorizing 
committee for your agency, the appropriating subcommittee for your agency, and then the full committee on appropriations, as well as any other authorizing committees, because often jurisdiction is spread. Uh, yeah, I mean, like anyone who knew who J.D. Vance was hated him because, you know, he's J.D. fucking Vance. But like most people knew him as the hillbilly elegy guy. And I got to be honest with you, liberals fucking loved that book. OK, a lot of people are clowning on him now for it. When that book came out. Liberals were falling over themselves to be like, this guy's great. Like, that's why it got made into a film. That's why, like, people are like, oh, I love that movie. It's not, a, it's not a good book or a good movie, but, like, a lot of people on the left were like, hey, the J.D. Vates guy's pretty okay, probably. I'm not going to look into it any further. <laughs> Ah, this is my voice for the average liberal. Hi. Wow, your lawn looks great. You must be watering it pretty consistently. What kind of bushes are those? Oh, it's none of my beeswax bush? Ah, one of my favorites, too. Bye. Uh, throughout uh, different committees. But you've got to really have those relationships locked down. Now, in many cases, when you're a legislative affairs person, you might it actually have a direct a relationship yeah, with Netflix. the principal. But your principal, your cabinet secretary, your undersecretary is also a really big gun. And those are the kind of people that members want to get to know. Members want to have um, that relationship. And I, I think you hit on such a great point about these relationships. First of all, like, I think we overestimate and we think of uh, lobbying as this kind of super complicated thing where you have to be chummy and, and have drinks with. It, it's not a super complicated thing. You get money and favors to do things. People and, and, and like be best friends with congressional staff in order to achieve stuff. Actually, in order to get most of the benefit out of a relationship, you just need to know that person. You just need to have that introductory meeting. You need to have an introductory meeting without an ask. So it's just like, hey, I'm James, I'm Hugh, I, you know, this is what we do, if I'm ever messing your stuff up, and then get that cell phone number. I think what the point you made is so important. A lot of times we're dealing with a huge aperture of policy. We don't have time to monitor every piece of political development throughout that, that, that legislative process. So sometimes you end up jammed. And that's when your cell phone number and your introductory meeting pay dividends because you can have that frictionless conversation with the decision maker that you need. And so that's really, really key is just segment and then get yourself in the door face to face with these guys make sure they have your cell and you have you have their cell absolutely critical and and you know really that's a lot of it once you're there that's when you can think about strategy that's when you can think about all these different things but that basic introduction is really the foundation of um uh how we approach things then i would also maintain your record keeping Right? Uh, I think it's really important to come in with a robust understanding of what, we, what we're trying to do, what you have done for a particular decision maker and what you want to do, um, as well as different interactions, different asks that they have. Like that, that record keeping is really going to stand you in good stead because what it serves as is the basis of strategy, right? You know, it, it, I love that these guys have taken 23 minutes out of their lives to describe essentially keeping a Rolodex, you know, like, yeah, you know, you should have like a, some kind of uh, thing where you write down everyone you know, and then, you know, like, uh, make sure you schedule times to have meetings with these people and, uh, you know, get to know them and, and talk to them. You know, write down some of their personal details so that uh, you, you know how to connect with them like you're a human being and not some sort of, you know, uh, man-fly hybrid. You know, I, I don't know. I'm just spitballing here. I don't know you personally. I'm just saying a lot of you act like man-fly man hybrids, you know. We, we do the basics, we get, we get in the door, we talk to these people, whatever, then we build a strategy, right? And so you, you want to talk a little bit about how you think about, so we talked a little bit about staff relationships, maybe how Gravity you think is about the most terrifying once we have kind of the ring. basic relational sort of architecture of our particular position, it could be the Commerce Department, the EPA, 
How do we proceed then in the generation of kind of a legislative strategy based on those relationships? I just acquired one of my favorite weapons in all of Elden Ring. The regalia of EOK. Yeah, no matter what agency or, or sub-agency or what part of the administration is, if you have an adversarial Congress, you can almost assure that your boss at some point is going to get brought before the committee. So you want to be able to delineate what members uh, your boss need to meet with. Um, ahead of those Very committee cool. hearings or ahead of those questions um, so that you're able to, one, make sure that favorable questions are asked, and two, potentially, um, uh, you know, head off any questions that might be, uh, you know, hard for your boss to answer or for the administration to navigate. Um, and I think having that uh, member-to-member or principal-to-principal relationship is going to be really important to make sure that they know that it's not just the administration's uh, you know, goals to, to help advance what's going on on the Hill, but it's also the members in members' direct interest that there are a lot of things in their district or in their state that are really important in that agency. And so being able to help them advance their priorities um, is something that they want. And they want to have a closeness with the, with the administration in a way that um, shows that they're doing work, that they're able to accomplish things, but ultimately that they're able to tackle some of the things that might be important for their, for their district or state. Well, since you brought it up, let's talk, let's talk hearing preparation just a little bit briefly. I think that's a core aspect of, of some of the, like, you know, some agencies have a pretty heavy hearing tempo, others don't. Um, what are some of the key elements? You know, you've, you've done this with a number of different administration officials, murder boards, the rhythm of a hearing. How do you think about maybe setting that up? Yeah, so you'll want to make sure that um, you have a bead on um, who, the, uh, who your opponents in Congress might be. So those are going to be people probably, um, you know, who don't share the administration's values or your boss's values. Um, and, and get a sense for what they've asked in the past of these types of hearings because you know, a lot of these hearings happen um, you know, administration to administration, year to year. So you get a pretty good sense of what they might ask. So you do a little opposition research. Um, and, but then you want to set up um, you know, a murder board. So basically um, make sure that your uh, principal is as prepared for the hearing or prepared for an interview as possible. So you're creating basically a list um, of charges and responses based off of those, uh, off your opposition research. So then you want to work with uh, your allies on the committee or allies um, in the Congress on saying, these are the things that we are likely to be asked. These might be good follow-up questions to ask. Um, but also if I get jammed on a question, you know, give me some time, rehabilitate the witness, give me some time to respond. Yeah, murder boards, guys. Murder boards. What, you weren't aware of the murder boards full of murder and such? Come on now. Come on! Thought they hated death panels? Yeah, when, when they're not the ones doing them that isn't directly going to suck up um, a question from you. Um, and then ultimately, it looks like maybe doing meetings beforehand. Mm -hmm. So bringing people into the room, saying, here's where we're at, and getting actual answers to their questions about what they may have so they're able to better understand the subject matter. And I think that's a really important point, the rhythm of the hearing, right? I mean, I haven't testified in front of Congress. I don't, I don't know if you have. I don't, I don't think you have. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, there's a, a fundamental difference between getting beat down for five minutes and then uh, getting a break for five minutes versus getting hit continuously with hostile questioning. And so, you know, getting to that rhythm and, and, and getting members there, right? Like a lot of, you know, we were talking about the subcommittee level or, or, or otherwise, you know, members aren't, you know, your, your members might not want to come Sorry. to a hearing that's deliberately crafted by the uh, opponents of the, of the presidential administration. Uh, like they, you know, they don't they don't particularly focus on the, on the issue set that, that that this is this is set up to beat you yeah, down they with. Might, they it's might not something that's very favorable to the administration. Reason. But if the if the members of Congress who defend you aren't going to be in the room, you're going to have a long long morning. So. Yeah, that's a, that's an extremely important point because of the way that uh, you alternate between one side and the other and asking questions. If there aren't uh, a stream or there aren't members um, there to defend you, then you're going to be just inundated with hostile questions. And so being able to get that break and answer questions about the subject matter from friendly uh, members is really important. Yeah, a lot of this is actually like, hey, here's how you get to know people. Do.
not come. Um, you know, so kind of progressing in the know, third point, knowing for me right the members um, that are aligned with your administration's issues. How do you go about knowing those? How would you go about researching them? Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's a, a congressional track record if they're in Congress. Sure. There's not a track record if they've not been in Congress. So how do you be able to identify those issues so that, you know, if your agency or your sub-agency or whatever part of the administration is, does something in that member's kind of interest area that you're able to, you know, to push it to them and have them echo and support and, and come out and endorse what you've done? So this is this notion of issue uptake, which is such an important issue. Like, how, like. And it really is one of the trickier aspects of legislative affairs, which is we are trying to find uh, what in a former uh, life you and I would call a champion, right? We're trying to, 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 to find a champion who is not merely going to support an administration policy when he has a decision point call, directly in front of him, but to actually advocate life? and advance that administration priority. That's tough. But what you need, going back to the segmentation, is a pretty good psychographic profile of how members tell themselves stories about their careers. Um, and, you know, I think probably, you know, obviously there's some of the, the clear ones, congress.gov. If the member has decided to introduce a bill on it, that's the most costly thing a member can do from a time, staff, and political perspective in terms of position taking. Well, that means they're probably pretty interested in the subject matter. And if you have an administration initiative that's orthogonal, right, maybe it's about government waste, maybe it's about deregulation, maybe it's about, uh, yeah, you, know, you got to get those orthogs American in, energy. Okay? They happen to be, you know, a, a big proponent of that. I think it's about nuclear energy. They're a big proponent of nuclear energy. That's going to be, a, you're going to be pushing on an open door. So doing that psychographic profile, I would also strongly advise anybody to look, get the Almanac of American Politics, the latest version, spend the 85 bucks. Uh, it is incredible. It will give you an understanding of the geography, both political and social and human, of every member of Congress, every governor and every senator. It is incredible. And from that, you can start to build out uh, what your targets are and what you what you think might be best. Um, the other thing is, you know, you gotta, uh, at that point, right, so uptake is, is a heavier ass than vote, so that's when you get your principal in there. That's when you do a little star star power, right? You get, the, you get the secretary, you get the administrator, you get the director over there and say, hey, we'd really like to do this, which will show the... I, can I just say that I feel like this entire how-to video here is very telling insofar as like they don't view this as people interacting with each other it's very obvious they don't view the people that they're interacting with as people they view them as like machines mechanisms for getting what they want you know and uh, on a certain level here, I, I, I feel like that is indicative of how they view all people, you know? It, it's not even teaching toddlers how to politic. It's, it's they fundamentally can't just show an interest in other people, you know? Like, I'm autistic. Social interaction for me is hard, but, like... I, under, I, I have a curiosity about people. I want to know other people, and that fuels my questions. That fuels how I talk with people and, like, how I interact. And, like, thinking about social interactions the way that they are outlining here is, like, I, I, I find that hard to wrap my head around because it's as if you had aliens trying to interact with human beings. You know, does that kind of I, I feel like I feel like that I, I've been trying to articulate my feelings on this as I've been listening to them. And it's it's been difficult. Yeah, it, it, the, the off putting thing about these two is the obsequiousness of it. It, it is the um, yeah, you know, you don't really have to view them as people. You just, um, you know, you. You buy you buy a manual and it tells you everything you really need to know about them and uh, that manual will show that will will show like how what what like who gives them money and like what they value and that's all you really need to know about them. You don't need to know you know uh, you don't need to ask about their wife and kids because you genuinely care. You just need to like you know pretend. 
Yeah, th honestly, this is kind of like some American psycho shit. The, the uh, uh, member or the senator that the administration is committed to this policy and therefore if they do pursue this policy they can expect to receive actual backing as opposed to merely a thank you from a staff which I would love it to be a, a gracious sufficiency is often insufficient for uh, members of Congress. So, Yeah, and one, one area that I found major success in was, especially if they had a long track record, was just going back through old press releases. You know, uh, a digital, so digital communications has not always been a real thing. And so the standard of uh, press releases and sort of old school uh, communications um, has only, you know, it's only in the last handful of years really changed. So if they've been in Congress for a lengthy period of time, going back, you're going to find most amount of information in old press releases. This is absolutely maybe the best tip. Like if you walk out of here with nothing, understand that you may understand what a member cares about by what he issues press releases on at a very rapid clip. Everything else is built on top of that. And like those press releases will tell you immediately what they care about. They will tell you how they think about an issue, right? Um, and uh, uh, just totally invaluable in terms of in terms there is no better member evaluation tool out there than the media tab of a members congress.gov website uh, uh, in terms of time investment versus output and so go through that know those yeah. I think that's absolutely like really critical kind of congressional lore yeah and they, they will tell you what they're can I can I just say like this all, all everything that they're talking about right now how they're how they're phrasing everything. This is why people hate politicians and people who work in politics, because they treat people like I, I don't know, like trading cards, like Pokemon. Like it, it, it's really bizarre and off-putting and weird. And like that isn't even me trying to take like a jab at them for being you know, Republicans and that being like the, the go-to like thing right now, calling them weird. They're just being weird. And it's why Tim Walls in particular is their kryptonite. Because even though he's weak, like even though he's like, you know, weird, he'll cop to it. He's just himself. He has an authenticity that these people could never achieve. Can you see either of these, like, sycophantic ghouls ever having an ounce of the gee whiz, like, joy Tim Walls routinely shows in his day-to-day -day life? No! Not even a little. Not even remotely. Are you kidding me? Trying to do. Yeah, and they will tell what they care about. And those are communicated because they want people in their district. They want people in the media to know. Um, and uh, in similar fashion, they, most members will issue like a weekly or a monthly newsletter. And those are going to communicate even more deliberately about um, what it is in either the district or what it is in the Congress that they're doing. Um, and a lot of that stuff can pop up over August recess. And can you talk a little bit about why that might be important? So members are receiving and being barraged by a constant stream of information, right? And so they, unlike normal sort of people who, are, who don't have to do this, members are constantly forced to make permanent, irrevocable decisions about what they think about politics or, or policies, right? So like, you and I will not have not voted Right, but you vote as a member, and you are like sort of permanently liable for that vote throughout the entire recorded span of the American Republic. So they're constantly kind of on the lookout for real information about what a particular decision actually means. And so during recess, um, in a lot of cases, they'll be home, and when people bring stuff up to them directly, they pay attention. And so you know, if you can, if you can. Find a way to get information uh, emitted to, to members when they're in their districts in addition to from like key local decision makers or whatever, that's really gonna change uh, an, a member's political calculus in a way that a merely DC lobbying can't. They listen to their districts, they listen to, the, to their local papers, they, they listen to those things, and they, they find that information very real and very persuasive. And even if it's not persuasive, it changes the political calculus. And so 
uh, thinking about how you can, you know, maybe influence a member in the, in the district or show that an issue affects the district you kind of is really, really JD important. Vance I think that's a good segue uh, to something that is a, a key advantage. You've got a lot of deficiencies in uh, the administration. It's a difficult job, very difficult job. And so lobbying is a hard job and doing it well is even harder. But one of the core advantages you have is your ability to produce information, right? So August is a particularly critical time to apply and deploy that information. But you know you have the, a horde of careers available to you that work work uh, essentially for you, depending on the division. You know, real information about how government programs are actually working is often quite difficult to acquire. Like who, how much, how it's working. You can get all that stuff. You can get it correctly, and you can get it out to sort of influence the information space. So understanding how your career staff and your your, pol your other policy divisions are like producing information and understanding how you can frame the terms of that debate, like how much money is being spent, how much money has been spent on a particular thing. That's very difficult to acquire for an outside observer, but you can choose and pick uh, that information uh, uh, because you have access to that, to that information fashioning power, which is so powerful. Yes, learning about people does allow you and deepen your connection with them and allows you to uh, call upon them at times. I think in, in particular, knowing, um, and, and as we kind of wrap up here, knowing um, what you talked about, knowing what your uh, uh, powers are, right? Knowing how and what levers you have and when to pull them, mm -hmm. um, that's not always communicated from one administration to the next. So um, if you do get a job, you should try to find the person most aligned with you who had the job prior to you. Mm -hmm. Go meet with them, go talk to them, ask them, hey, should I, uh, should I go meet with anybody else? Like, get to know the people and ask them what it is that they didn't know when they showed up that, yeah. that you would like to know. Um, and so um, just in conclusion, um, you know, uh, I think you know, staff relationships obviously matter, principal relationships really matter, and knowing the issues uh, that, uh, of the members with direct equities on the... On but also, you know what else matters? Making sure you're not too close to those careers. They're filthy and disgusting. Stay away from them. Like committees or um, that are directly interested in your agency or sub agencies, uh, you know, um, bucket no. of, of issues are is really important. I don't know if you had any closing yeah, thoughts. Yeah, so I'll just I'll just make two 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 uh, points as expeditiously as I can. Number one, part of the the, the difficulty and core of, of being an effective legislative st affairs staffer is understanding what you have actually have to accomplish on a particular administration policy initiative. You know, if you can do it solely through executive action, that means you need to protect the executive action. You don't have to go out there and, and um, uh, pass a law, right? And so what you do need to do is prevent an executive action that could be politically unpopular in the Congress by preventing the junction of Republicans and Democrats, right? Well, that, that's, that's when, the, I mean, the, Congress is the Article I branch. The executive branch in modern times is more powerful, but Congress unified will be. And so, you need to prevent the effectuation of that junction. That's really important. So thinking through that is, is, is key. You know, if you, wanna, if you need to pass a bill, you need to get, I don't know, $500 million for something. Well, that's going to have to get passed through the Congress. Yeah, if you need to get $500 million for something. You know, just treat them like Pokemans. And Congress requires bipartisan action for the most part. If you're if you're trying to beat a filibuster at 60, um, and so calibrating your investment, calibrating the the expectations of your team, um, is really important. And then finally, I would just say, you know, it, there's an old adage in Washington: uh, friends come and go, but enemies are forever. Very heady stuff leading the administration's position on Capitol Hill. Don't be a jerk always maintain your relationships. It's always better to, to, to not burn somebody. And so that's the thought I would, I would definitely leave with. Don't be too aggressive, be firm, be tough in the service of the president's agenda, but, but do not be a jerk. Yeah, that's a great point to end on, James. Yeah, unfortunately it flies in the face of literally everything else. Everyone in Project 2025 has been saying.
you know, literally, literally in the first video, those ladies were like, yeah, if somebody asks your pronouns, make a giant sting about it. Like, <laughs> uh, like, I don't know what to tell you guys. Like, don't be a jerk about it. But like your policies that you're pushing for are inherently jerky. Like, I, I don't know what to tell you, man. Yeah, be firm with the couch. Thank you for uh, this discussion, and hopefully it's uh, fruitful to those uh, watching. Absolutely. Thanks, you.